I think I think that's a help. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our poetry reading tonight. Uh, not only a poetry reading tonight, but welcome to the kickoff of our 17th season. So the Milwaukee Poetry Series has been going 17 years. Uh, we started back in uh, 2007, and we are a series that goes through July. So we have a poster about that, and the posters are, are back here in two sizes. So please feel free. I'll say more than feel free. If you know a place that, uh, that they would go up, that would be great. Uh, please uh, take what you need. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here. I'd like to welcome everybody who is uh, logging in on our live stream as well. So thank you for being here and participating in the, the reading. We have a real treat tonight. Uh, we have a, uh, a great poet. And there really are so many things that you could be doing. And we appreciate it that you're here, if you're here in person, or if you've logged on to the, uh, the live stream, if you're watching the event. So we appreciate that, that uh, you came and uh, spent the time with us. I want to say some thanks. Thanks to the City of Milwaukee. The City of Milwaukee has supported us from the beginning, and so we are very grateful. The city's uh, just in a move and is moving City Hall, moving down the street about three blocks. So a thanks to the city of Milwaukee. A big thanks to the Letting Library. We're here in this great facility. This is a, a new library. So thanks to uh, the Letting Library. We're very uh, appreciative of partnerships with them. Thanks to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. We have a poetry committee. And we have some committee members here, I think. Uh, could they uh, raise their hands? There's uh, over here. Kristen Roeder over here, and my lovely wife, Jane. So can we give them a hand? <laughs> Thank you very much for doing that, because as you know, you don't have an event, and you don't have something happen unless you have a, a group of people working on it. Uh, another uh, people we want to thank as Willamette Falls Media and our technician over here, Josh Reynolds, who is uh, operating the equipment tonight and is the one who is responsible for really putting this all on the air and having it like it sounds. Josh Reynolds right here from Willamette Falls Media. Uh, and I was going to acknowledge Tara Go, who is, when she was here, she's our, our staff person from the Letting Library, but she just walked out, and so I think when she comes back in, uh, I will uh, ask her to do that. I want to say a couple of things about events that are coming up. Uh, we do partner with St. John the Evangelist for First Fridays, while there are First Fridays. That's a program that runs May through October. So the last First Friday of the month is the First Friday in October, and I think that's the 6th. And that reading is going to be at St. John the Evangelist in Milwaukee, and there'll be a flyer out about that. We're just starting our season, as I said. And our reader in October is Michelle Glazer. So we're uh, excited about that. And she's going to be reading on the second Wednesday of October, which I, the date I think is, I'm not sure. What is it? 11th. All right. October 11th. Well, we're going to proceed tonight, and I'm going to introduce our poet. Then we're going to have a question and answer period for a bit. Then he's going to conclude with a, uh, a final poem. And as I said, we have a real treat tonight. I, I've been looking forward uh, to this. And Richard uh, Leonard's first book of poems, A Short History of the Usual, A Short History of the Usual, was published in 2003 by the Blackwater's Press. His second book, The Only Empty Place, was published in 2023. So it's a fairly new book. Uh, his poems have appeared in Poetry, The Sun, Prairie Schooner, Mid-American Review, Barrow Street, Southern Review, 
Spoon River, Poetry Review, and many other journals. Uh, he's done very things in his life from 1987 to 1996. He was the music editor of Stereophile Magazine, and since then has worked as a freelance music critic and an editor and copywriter of books and magazines. After 30 years in northern New Mexico, he and his wife, Susanna, have now lived 12 years in Ashland, Oregon, and as they say it, on the other side of the tracks. <laughs> so we'll have to see exactly where the other side of the tracks is in Ashland, Oregon. Would you join me in welcoming our poet tonight, Richard Leonard. Richard. Uh, Oh, let me remind you too, while I'm still here, I have this on the, uh, the podium, so please silence your uh, phones and your telephonic devices. Airplane mode or poetry reading mode, if you have that. <laughs> yes. Well, good evening. Um, I thank the uh, Milwaukee Poetry Series for inviting me to give the first reading in the 17th season. And I thank the city of Milwaukee and the Letting Library for hosting uh, the series all these years. And I thank Tom Hogan for his thorough and uh, careful work in preparing it all and for introducing me. It's been a pleasure to work with throughout. Uh, this reading uh, makes a few things new to me. Uh, until a few months ago, I'd been unaware of the existence of any Milwaukee other than an obscure Wisconsin hamlet of crucially different spelling. <laughs> also new to me are almost everyone in this room. Um, uh, for the past 15 years, I haven't given a single poetry reading outside of Ashland, Oregon, where the audience for poetry is as small as it is warm and dedicated and supportive. I'm grateful to be able to share my work with a room full of people to whom it, I suspect it will be entirely new. Uh, tonight, I'll be reading mostly from my new book, uh, The Only Empty Place. It's long for a book of poems, 149 pages. The uh, 91 poems in it were selected from almost three times that many, almost all of them written in the 20 years since the publication of my first book, Short History of the Usual, which Tom just mentioned. And I'll read a few poems from this one as well. This book is now extremely out of print. Um, there are copies occasionally pop up online for prices that are either embarrassingly low or embarrassingly high. So I have none for sale tonight. The new book costs 18 bucks and it'll be available in the back after the reading. A note about the reading. I prefer to let my poems speak for themselves. Um, after all, ultimately, they'll have to do that anyway. So between poems, I'll say little or mostly nothing by way of introduction or explanation or context or scene setting or apology for that matter. Instead, I'll leave a bit of silence after each poem. After all, the music of poetry, like the music of music, is really just a way of carving silence. The Last Restaurant. Somewhere in Tuscany, Provence, Oaxaca, a restaurant you've never seen calls you all your life, its menu unrequited. A restaurant so good, no one knows it. It opens for one dinner only. The officious maitre d' leads you through the dining room's underwater light to a good table by a window. The sounds of metal on china are small, precise. From the kitchen, a mysterious clank and hiss, an unparsable syntax of smells. The waitress is young, tall, forgetful. Her red wine tastes like beloved old books. She drifts off and the room slowly fills. Two former lovers gaze in each other's eyes as you once looked separately in each of theirs. 
your parents who don't recognize you. An African woman and man in crisp white, fresh from their mass graves, blank dignity. Your brother, the wounds that killed him almost healed, sits with your dead wife, her hair grown back, parted in a new place. The room is small, but soon the familiar heads of everyone you've hurt, lost, cared nothing for, bow over menus, look up to ask about specials, ponder the great dualities, animal or vegetable, wine or water, later or now. You eavesdrop and never hear your name, but then someone's eye meets yours and he smiles. Your mother asks your father if you're someone they know. He squints at you, turns to her and shrugs, complains about the prices. This is as far as you ever get, but someday the waitress will remember and return with her plate of bread and oil to ask one of three riddles. Do you know what you want? Would you like more time? Are you ready? Thanks for that. Um, but you don't need to applaud after every poem or even the ones that you particularly like. Um, I'd prefer if you didn't, actually. So thank you. in a small planetarium. After the projector hums its last slow spray of stars against the perfect black, after our guide has chanted the last unimaginable sums of distance and of time, after a clockwork dawn pinks the rings of seats canted back, after closing cadences of music light and voice coax us to give way to those who will follow. And before the last of us is gone, the woman whose script has led us from blinding bang to whimper and then again to bang touches something wrong. And there above us, past the dome of scrim, now only gauze and gray, one bare bulb glows dim on cartons rising, jumbled in the gloom past curved space. All those other universes, packed and stacked and labeled, used, worn out, and stored forever here, or new and waiting to be opened, though not by us. Adult, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> adultery. I love how the all-white cat appears like her own ghost each night at 11, wanting, as I've learned, not shelter, food, or water, but simply to be let inside, to take with quick greed my rough caress, then leave behind her long, well-cared-for hair in rug and couch and hands my wife's lungs. Not knowing the name whoever keeps her calls her by, to her no name but a moment of which she is the heart, I croon to her the usual generics and diminutives, and she answers in what this animal hears as passion, our lover's litany emptied of sense, filled with heat, and after her desire to leave is just as urgent and as hot. Though her life is not knowable or secret, I am pleased to smugness by this thrill unsharpened by guilt, that those who think they own her don't know we meet like this, that I don't wonder if she loves for what I give or if she loves at all as she takes 
in my company her inexplicable pleasure. When Johnny comes marching home. Sunlight yellowed through the long ripped canvas shades as our pigtails and brush cuts crowded the single room for that week's music lesson. I remember nothing of the teacher but see her piano still, its stained and broken green. In our frame-built school, all was old but us. Desks of dark wood and floral iron. Inkwells dried up who knew when. Brass hooked poles to push up tall and warping glass. And in fall, tawny boards agleam with varnish. At every step, they spoke. When the teacher asked which song we should sing, there was one I loved for its drumming rhythm, the grief in its dark joy, though then I did not know we sang no other in minor key. Into that amber light whose slow fall through the day took a time my body was yet too small to clock, I raised my hand and she said, ah, I know which song you want to sing. In splintered ivory, her fingers found the full and soured chords, and for the first time, I knew I had asked for this song before, and she had seen my joy in it. Then everyone sang my desire, and in the air of that high room, filled with dust and light and voices, in a building now long gone, in a town we left soon after, among children who were then my world and of whom I now cannot see one face, I took up my part in the great swell of time and began that day to be one who is remembered, if only for his song. To whom it may concern. Two windowless weeks of heaving 50 pound crates of greeting cards, and already in that warehouse, I was senior grunt, for no one lasted long. And no wonder, I said to the boss's son, as he picked the day's orders of sympathy and condolence. Like me, he was 17 in his face under wincing fluorescence, a kind of grace, so pure his joy in power, as elbow deep in bereavements, only now knowing he could, he said, I could get you fired. Full of weaknesses I had yet to learn were the poet's strengths of failure and grief. I stood among the world's worst poems, asleep by their millions in cardboard slums, mumbling to themselves their poor sweet prayers. So easy to despise their automatic rhyme and rattling rhythm. So easy to hate with a boy's pure hate, the smoothness of another boy's smug and frightened face. So I despised and hated. For those two were strengths loud in my voice as I said, I'm sure you could do just that. And threw on its sagging shelf a box of regrets. When later that day I was fired, I walked a last time those aisles of dusty occasions from birth through graduation, wedding and get well past all my birthdays numbered in advance, past sorry for your loss, 
And just before the steel door opening to the street, those simplest notes, the rest impersonate, their two words waiting for scrawls of names to make them truth or lie or both. A thousand thank yous. And then the light. This is one from my <coughs> years of working in restaurants. Snail after snail. From the can, you finger one shellless snail. The raw animal, shapeless and green black, gleams in its bloodless grease. From the box, a snailless shell. Its bones spiral dry, bleached white, like something surfaced on a desert, once the bottom of a sea. Into shell, you tamp body, all internal organ. Seal the coiled crypt with a slab of butter, garlic marbled, flecked with parsley malachite. This strikes you as an almost noble futility, a great heroic foolishness like spinning gold of straw, numbering stars, the braiding of sand into rope, the mountain come from some Mohammed of there to hear one unwilling teaspoon at a time. And you, in this kitchen, its loud heat something you're still not wise enough to get out of, stuffing into shells snail after snail, like some literal-minded little god for whom no one ever learns enough, ramming back down the body's throat, soul after sleeping soul. <clears throat> this one is for um, all the men in the audience. I see a few. It's called um, To Knowing, To Knowing. In a bookstore, hidden speakers mumble a jazz tune I know from an album I know well. I ease up to the still clerk, stooped white-haired behind his neatly cluttered counter, tilt my head to one side, and as if asking, but only to impress, say, isn't that and then name the player and the song. Of the tune, he's not sure. And as I say, I know it is what I say it is. My voice, telling myself what I know, rises hard and big and stiff. Not quite smiling or meeting my barely seeing gaze, he leans his own head to a gentler cant and says, in calm so still I almost do not hear. Well then, I guess you know. <clears throat> the next uh, two poems are two poems from Germany. Um, the title of the first one is Verdammt which is German, for those of you who know the language, um, meaning damned. Verdammt. The war still lush in Vietnam. I, the age for it, and walking this small German city's empty Sunday streets, when an older Bavarian, heavy in her thick strength, flowered hat, fat dachshund, takes my stride in hers. As the Germans do not, she speaks. And when she hears my Deutsch wears colors not hers, fat tears blub down her lips for her son, she says, who for reasons in a language she cannot translate, joined my country's war and is dead. 
for going so far out of his way to beat death from the bush and make it answer. She calls him verdammte Tor, damned fool. And as she curses him, her chin's small prow parts waves of her shaking flesh. Of the questions I do not ask, does she have a son? Is he dead? Is she crazy? Am I a coward or fool? How can it be that as we walk, she sobs and never asks what each stumped step demands of that verdompte street in that verdompte town, verdompte pavement pounding up at her feet, my feet, the fat dog's fat verdompte feet. The only question, why? Her son is dead and I am not. Dachau, August, 1974, for Mark Brownstein. Golden dust, blue sky, and heat. Where huts were, now wide, dry grounds. People, well-fed, in bright colors, shuffling slowly, quietly. Braunstein and I, for once not talking Kierkegaard. Mark, do you still live? Already once you had tried not to. If you read this, forgive me. If there were birds, I do not remember. How can there not have been birds? And insects flying, crawling, buzzing. We all had business there. It was such a beautiful day. An open door we walked through, and there were the ovens as in photos we had seen, as all of us had seen, there they were, yes, and we there too at last, brick and flesh and rusted iron. Touching made it only so real and no more. There was the train that took us there, now the train we took back. Of that day, I remember nothing else. What had happened there before has happened elsewhere since. It never stopped. It is happening now. Mark, these 40 years lost, I wanted to tell you. Of human grounds I have walked, those were the most still. The peace of one place where the worst that can happen already has. Two poems about animals and boys. Fetch. You braved our Badlands campsite, big and strong and silent, thick fur of soot and ash, black pointed ears, dark dignity. Your unbreaking gaze held mine, so, of course, I called you wolf, meaning by the name all a boy of 12 white years could mean in that American West of 1963. How did I know you were no one's dog? How did we know you chose us? We must have fed you something. It filled more than your belly. For then we were yours, anyone who neared us now a threat to growl or bark or charge away. You guarded us all night, a half wild distance from our fire. 
your eyes coals in the dark. They sent light back to where I lay, awake in my thin summer bag beside my sleeping father. At dawn, you still there, still ours. We'd never had a dog. I wanted none till you, after you, no other. I begged to take you home, knew there was no hope. For once, when he refused, dad was kind. As we packed, you paced, sister to mother to father to me. You knew what was coming was our going. And when at last we drove away, you followed fast, shoulders low, long legs working, not tiring, down miles of dirt to the highway. You cut each switchback across, threw yourself through scrub and scree, nothing in you held back, you never stopped or slowed. Staring out the rear window through the dust we raised between us, I yearned toward your yearning, would not look away, would not dishonor your four strong legs, your stronger heart, would not give myself the lie that we had not betrayed you. Our tires found asphalt, outran you. I turned, weeping, to face ahead the 60 years just past, all like you behind me now. I knew I would not forget. In that, I have been true. You are long gone into time, perhaps dead that same year to rifle, rattler, ranger's poisoned beef, or your heart given to one better worth your trust. Thank you. Wolf, for never letting go this ancient boy's small, tight heart, worried by love to soft rags. Loose your aching jaws, let it fall, soaked with sorrow, into my empty hand. Mules for my father and someone else's son somewhere in California, sometime in the early 1950s. In the supple, invincible body most of us can remember, after miles of switchbacks, glad for straightaway at last, the boy had run hooting down the steep, rocky trail at the bottom another cliff top, and he could not stop. A day for the troop to climb down to where he'd struck, stretched out in the straight line of his flight, face wedged between two rocks, his blood by then bled and dried, his body hardened stiff. Dad was scoutmaster, so it was he who told the parents, but how that day to be him as he drove to where they lived out their last minutes of not knowing. How carry to them their dark new world as their street appeared where all along it had to, then their house. He parked, let go the sticky steering wheel, turned the key, pulled it out, opened the car door and with needless quiet closed it, these things done each day without thought, now taking not nearly long enough. Already they were done, and he stood, listened to the engine tick and cool, as if it could tell him how to do this, then walked up flags to the steps, the porch, the door, on it his knuckles, still only he knowing who really knocked whose part he now played as they let him in and he spoke. We know what he said. How did he say it? What were the words? How many times did he start before he could say what could not be said, not to them? When he stopped speaking, the woman 
and the man sat a long time saying nothing, a new silence in that house. Then they thanked him for coming to tell them. They knew it must be hard. It was that he could not bear, he told me, by not saying so, though he bore it 60 years. That and what he told not them, but 30 years later, only me. On the hike down the mountain, he trudged last to keep in sight the long, loose line of living boys, and always just ahead of him, the dead boy's unbendable body wrapped in a tarp balanced across the pack mule's shimmering black back. With each shift of withers and haunch, the boy's feet on one side rising, his head on the other side falling, then the other way, then again, three days down the mountain, mile after mile after mile, from side to side of the sweating mule. You know, I do think it takes a special kind of poet who can live uh, 30 years in northern New Mexico and end up writing only two poems about the place. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that is the case, and here is one of them. Goatless and Drunk. Manuel wandered by to sell me a goat. It might have been his. When I wouldn't buy it, he sulked off, shaking his beard, his long gray hair, the goat's tether. On his way home across the acequia, he met someone who bought the goat, as in a thousand stories Manuel had never heard. And in what for him was haste, he stumbled off to buy one goat's worth of drink and smoke. Back in his old adobe, deep in middens of empty bottles, spam can drifts. The booze put him to sleep. His last cigarette put him out, smothered by mattress smoke, cooked slow all night till the meat fell off his bones, the mud walls sticky with his fats. Heads shook along the Potrero ditch, shrugged off sighs passed for grief. What could you say? It sounded like Manuel. I never risked his heavy, generic, alcoholic intimacy. But one winter night, I found Manuel sitting in tall, dry grass like a one-year-old who's almost learned his legs, smiling, nodding, bending his own ear, too drunk to walk. Fearing he'd freeze to death, I offered a ride, then feared he'd puke or shit in my car. He rocked smiled, said, I'm drunk, then sighed, leaned back in perfect peace, and with royal gravity turned to confide a greater secret. I am so drunk. I remember when he leaned into me, how sweet he smelled as if everything good about him floated there in the rich, thick scent he didn't quite take with him when he went, the burnt sugar cloud that filled his house when, goatless and drunk, he cooked himself a last meal of his own sweet flesh and died with what happiness I cannot imagine. the last of you. Because I don't smoke, chew gum, and you did, it's been years since I opened the car ashtray. 
In a ranger station receipt from Mesa Verde, that last trip you were well, one hard, tight-wrapped ball of gum. Still dented by your teeth, it looks, feels like a molar from your shattered mouth, jaws burnt to ash, scattered with the rest of you. It clicks against my teeth now, its tasteless taste, a ghost of sweetness, your cells waiting years, inches from my knee as I drove, to be taken in, held beneath my tongue, swallowed, all that's left of you, again, part of me. I want this small meal to mean more than it can. The wanting is what means. This last taste of you, how far with me you've come to be this gone. Mr. Johnson, Apple, Mr. Johnson, Charity, Tunnel, Apple, Mr. Johnson, Charity, Tunnel. These words must be important to the doctor. He has asked me to remember them for him. He will want to hear them again later, he says. He gives me no tale to carry them in. I wonder, has he lost his story of how old Mr. Johnson, in the spirit of charity, gave him an apple at the mouth of the tunnel of love, for he knew it would be needed? Or was it Mr. Johnson's daughter, Charity, who, from the doctor's hand, took the apple, wrapped it in its name, and rolled it down the ever longer tunnel of her father's unknowing? But if the doctor thinks I know the Johnsons, one of us is mistaken. <laughs> or by apple, does the doctor mean this red, round, green, shining ball hard here in my hand, by tunnel, how I got here and will leave, by charity, how he will be paid, and I am Mr. Johnson? Or is the doctor wiser than he seems and telling me a story after all that when all other words are gone locked up in books and mouths i can no longer read in the light at that last tunnel's end i will in love relief and human charity drop into the open hand of god the last apple fallen from the tree of my knowledge and greet him with his one true name. Drywall. She took the place next door, and within a week, we disagreed about stuccoing a wall that joins and separates our houses. We patched the crack with the gift of decent wine, and days later, two blocks away, a drunk knew better than a sign that said, stop, and her daughter was dead. I haven't seen the woman since, though for weeks, the wheels of everyone she knows crushed our common gravel. Knowing and not knowing what to do, I left by her unanswered door a stupidity of flowers and a card. The traffic in Solus has thinned, and last night, through another wall, one wall inside both houses, I heard her long, deep, sobbing wail and thought, now it begins. What friends, flowers, cards, food, 
are meant to keep from beginning, this roar of the body rushing to fill that cold, deep space. I laid five fingers flat on this hard wall shared apart, felt her voice beat through block, drywall, and paint. Grateful for both, it came between, as into my open hand broke the waters of her grief. And I thought, with artist greed, here is the next poem. Ashamed to be so shameless, glad for the work. To the close enough, sorry, to the close enough. Two rooms away, you laugh into the phone, into your friend's distant life. This does not make me happy or sad, though I am glad you are here, so close you are almost there. The speed then stillness of the spider darning a corner near the ceiling remind me of the spiders in the tub. Sometimes, if one is still alive, I slip beneath it one blank sheet of paper and carry it outside, its long legs scribbling in perfect spider, escape. Just as often, I watch them drown. Then, in hands washed clean, pinch from the drain a snarl of spider legs and human hair. This reminds me that we will die. In this, the spider is like everything, especially through two shut doors, your laugh, of which someday the silence in these words will be the only trace. Those who never knew you will try to hear and will not get it right. They will not know how laughter gathered deep in your vanished flesh, then quickly climbed your body's web to pour from your open mouth that rich, sweet blaze. Though they will not know how far off they are, the something else they hear will be close enough. to wisdom. Already suspecting you will again go missing from anything I say, and knowing a critical distance is best, I can now, behind your own back, thank you for taking so long, for visiting first so many others, practicing on them your ever shorter, ever simpler lines until you are so clear even I can understand, even as in the long meanwhile I still find myself without you. So I began with a poem about a restaurant and I'm going to end with another poem about another restaurant. And those of you who have ever visited Florence, Oregon, and dined at a place called the Waterfront Depot may know this place that I'm talking about. It's called Exalted. A century and more ago, this bistro was a depot before the train stopped stopping its rails ripped up for scrap, town shriveled back to scrub. For years it sat, hollow-skulled, sliding baggage door toothlessly agape, then bought and pulled apart 
each wallboard prized from its stud, each shingle from its roof plank, and plank from strut, floorboard from joist, all numbered, stacked, and trucked from miles away to here, to be unpuzzled, reassembled, new nails through old holes into the same studs, struts, planks, joists, the building whole again, but as in any resurrection, different now in unplanned ways. Tighter there, looser here, odd groanings in the night. I know this because each time the stouter of the two waitresses strides thick calved behind me, her shoe and foot and leg, for half a second all of her and the laden tray she bears, pressed down on one floorboard, worn and ribbed and grain grooved, dark and smooth as old horn. I hear its moaning croak as the old board's other end, on which rests my chair's hind leg, rises. And so, throughout our meal, each time she passes, I am raised, lifted, elevated, exalted, to sit, however briefly, on a slightly higher plane. This waitress is not our waitress. She does not know she does this, or if she knows, cares not. She could step on a different board. I could move my chair one crucial inch. She always treads my board. I do not move my chair. She does not need to know. I do not need to tell her, or until much later, tell my wife, sitting unmoved here beside me, that a woman I have not met or spoken to, whose face I would not know again, from time to time, this evening, in an exaltation secret even to herself, inexplicably lifts my spirits, along with everything else. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Well, that's the one that I'm going to read after the Q&A. <laughs> Yes. Well, I didn't go away, um, <laughs> and it wasn't for lack of trying to get my second book published. Yeah. Over 15 years, and I would say six very different versions of that, of this book. I collected 127 rejection slips. Yes, and and spent sometimes, usually not, but a few times they did. Usually they said, very strong collection, but not for us. So who knows? So finally I self-published. I figured I had done that. I guess got tired of that, <laughs> of the rejection slips. So that's, but I was writing all through that period, all, that, all through that time. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes, but I don't do that anymore. Uh, partly because I, um, the poems are almost never accepted, uh, and uh, it just seems sort of like a waste of my energies. And I'm writing less and less these days. Um, and I, th I thought I would be writing for the rest of my life until until I died, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And uh, and I'm finding that that's a whole lot easier for me to accept than I thought it might be. So I'm figuring I will just let it happen. I'm, I'm happy to write, write poems again, should they appear, but they don't seem to want to anymore. Mm -hmm. No. No. <laughs> um, you know, whether it's either realism or um, 
Mm-hmm. Well, part of what I try to do is I try to be on the lookout for um, things that, uh, a subject that, um, to which my first response is, oh, well, you can't write a poem about that. And that's in, if when I have the presence of mind to, to realize that, that I'm thinking that I, I think, oh no, Richard, that's exactly what your next poem should be about. Because that's when you find something new, you know, you find something that you ha I haven't thought before. You know. it, yeah. it seems that your poems are sharp and intentional mm. and perfect. Mm. <laughs> Another thing that I that I look for in a, in a poem is, is uh, uh, in terms of what to write about. You know, is for a long time my modus operandi was was just to say, okay, whatever most terrifies me, that's what I need to write about, and, th and I need to take it all the way down to the mat as far as I can as I can, because then I, then and I found this to be true that I don't have to be frightened of it anymore, and also. Um, if, if anyone else reads the poem or if it's published, then um, I think the service that it can perform is that it tells whoever is reading it that these things actually can be spoken aloud and it's very freeing to do so. And uh, it gets the monkey off your back. And we do need to be able to talk about these yeah. most difficult things. And Yes. No idea. <laughs> I probably, I would probably, yeah. Uh -huh. Some people, you know, a lot of people do that as a, I mean, as a writing exercise. You know, they set themselves their own deadline or their own um, uh, stopwatch kind of thing. Uh, the, um, what is it? Um, is it the sun? I forget. One publication does a thing, do a poem, a d write a poem a day, you know for, for uh, a given month and then put it on a postcard and send it to somebody. And don't overthink it, don't spend too much time editing and that sort of thing. So. Hmm. I have done that a bit, not much, but I have done it a bit. Yeah. I have one student. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So I guess that's what comes first. So the question is, 
the memory, I mean, often, it's not like I have a whole lot to work with, you know? And I find out, I dredge it up, and you know, with all the research into memory, who knows how much I'm making up and how much I'm actually remembering. Um, and um, I just do the best I can. The ideal is always to be as absolutely faithful to the facts, to what actually happened as I recall them, as I can be. But at some point, in almost every poem, um, there's a point where the poem says, well, wait a minute, okay, that's what you want to do. I have a very different agenda, and, you, and I'm the boss here. And so I have, and the poem is the boss, I have to go with that. Yeah. And, and yes, and it's and it's uh, it's all my feeling, obviously, but but it's not necessarily the, the feeling that I thought I was going to be writing about. Yeah. Go ahead. The um, the mu the music in in the line. In the, in the poetry, in my in my choices of words, the rhythms in particular, the uh, the sounds, uh, how how I put this, I, they're basically these are scores for my voice, or anybody's voice who who knows how to read a poem aloud, um, and um, I try to to write them as carefully as I can so that the actual order and sounds of the of the the words embody and perform the meaning of the words. Uh, and you know, it's basic, basic prosody. But I, yeah, that, that's it. Yes. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> or dying. Not as passionately, no. I still am reading poetry. I have a few poets who I really, really care about very deeply, and I just keep going back to them again and again and again. Um, Merwin? I was from, he was the one I got the idea of giving up punctuation. Uh, I, don't, I haven't written with, I haven't used a single punctuation mark in 20 years in my poems, and he, he did that for 40 years. I was amazed by what he could do with that. Uh, Tony Hoagland, um, Jack Gilbert, um, Emily Dickinson, uh, Larry Levis. These are the people who mean a great deal to me. Sure. I happen to have a copy of it here. The Only Empty Place. Arriving late to a party I had almost not been asked to, and being no longer young, almost had not joined, seated by hosts I barely knew at their table's only empty place, poured a red glass, passed a white plate. There was a moment when the talking did not stop, when in some sourceless breeze the candles did not blink, when no sudden thrill of portent spidered up my spine, when nothing had happened or felt about to happen, when the woman to my left turned her face to me and introduced herself as you. In that moment, 50 years reworked their puzzled order. Every one now all along had led me slant to you. And as I gave you my name, another voice I had never heard, though it was my voice, sang to me small and clear. And this is what she looks like. Thank you.
So thank you so much for being here. Richard's books are available uh, back here, and his lovely wife, Susanna, is uh, selling them. There are some posters, which are back here. There's a broadside. If you don't have a broadside, please take a broadside. Please take a poster. We'd be happy to uh, have you do that. We also have some uh, surveys. And if you have not filled out a survey, could you complete that for us? Uh, we do have a grant. And so this uh, event has been partially supported by a grant from the Clackamas County Arts Alliance, administered by the uh, Clackamas County Arts Committee. And we are very grateful. Having your input is very helpful. I wonder if I could ask you to uh, hold up the uh, survey. If you have not filled out a survey, would you please, would you be willing to do that? That's helpful to us, so thank you very much. Thank you for being here. I want to thank those of you on, that are viewing this on live stream for logging in. Thank you. We're going to be back in October, October 11th uh, with Michelle Glazer, and we will be here, and we will also be live streaming. Thank you for my, very much for being here. I'm Tom Hogan for the Milwaukee Poetry Series. Have a great night. Thank you.